A high school student has built an AI framework that can predict air pollution levels with 92% accuracy. Welcome to Tech First with John Goodseer. Knowing when it's a high pollution day is pretty important for a lot of different people. If you have asthma, maybe you've got trouble breathing, maybe you're particularly sensitive particu to particulate matter in the air. Well, can AI help us predict those pollution levels, what they're going to be? And how the heck is a high school student building machine learning models? To find out, we're joined by Richard Wren, who is a grade 11 student at Jericho High School in New York. Richard, welcome. Hey, it's great to be here, John. Hey, excellent to have you. A uh, lot of fun. I think we're going to have, we're going to enjoy this here. You know, I mean, the first thing I thought when I saw what you were doing, the, the model that you had built and everything like that was, hey, you're predicting pollution better than the meteorologists are predicting weather. Is that correct? Um, I definitely, over the last 20 years, meteorologists, sorry, um, weather prediction models have um, really increased in accuracy. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great that I'm able to predict uh, pollution using these machine learning methods so reliably. Talk a little bit about prediction of weather. I mean, you obviously got deep in the subject if you're going to predict pollution levels and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. How solid are weather predictions these days? And, and um, wh what's the general level of accuracy? Yeah. Uh, my specialty is in pollution prediction, but um, from what I gather from like my literature search and so on and so forth, um, they've really improved over the last 20 years. So um, I'm in, my, in, my, in my mind, there's been like two major things. Um, first is that you're starting to see a lot more data being collected. You're starting to see the rise of big data and as well as these data sets being made publicly available, right? All of the data that I used was publicly available. And yeah. um, I think that's absolutely incredible accomplishment that, we're a that was able to um, come to fruition because of new technologies like the internet. Yeah. Um, second, so now it seems like the bottleneck is not really in the amount of data we have, but rather the methods for forecasting, say, weather or pollution, right? Um, so right now the NOAA is trying to incorporate machine learning methods into their, um, you know, more theoretical frameworks. So that way they can try to predict uh, air pollution um, as well as weather uh, far more accurately. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So you got to 92% accuracy. How long did it take to get there? Uh, took a long time. I would say maybe around a year. Wow. Um, so I started off uh, with like a Beijing uh, data set in which I tried to predict air pollution, uh, more specifically PM 2.5 pollution. So that's particulate matter 2.5 yes. microns or less in width. Um, and I did it solely based on weather, right? And that's sort of the pattern that you see in literature. They only take uh, one element that's extremely important while ignoring some of the other elements or they only use one uh, machine learning model, right? And so from that, so I was able to get maybe an 80 to 85% accuracy, but it's sort of like the 80-20 rule, like 20% of the effort for the first 80%. And then after the last, the last 20% is the most difficult. Yes. So for that, um, I made two major modifications. First, instead of just using, so in that model, I used a very simple uh, regression analysis, um, but uh, generally you sort of want to uh, try to incorporate more machine learning methods. Um, mm -hmm. So each machine learning method is special in that it has its upsides, it has its downsides. So upsides of neural networks, they tend to be quite accurate, especially for deep learning. Um, mm -hmm. but they require so much data, right? Random forests tend to be robust, but they also overfit. So they might conform too much to the data set while ignoring overall trends. Sure. Um, so you're seeing like these individual strengths and weaknesses. So if you try to take a, a, a multilateral approach and use multiple machine learning methodologies, you can get a more accurate result. Um, cool. So let's dive into that in a moment. I want to get into the details of which technologies you're using, how you implemented them, and how they all improved the accuracy levels. But maybe let's start here as well. How did you get into AI? Maybe even how did you start to code? Uh, where where did you start learning that? Yeah. Um, the great thing about getting into AI, um, so essentially I started because um, my grandparents and my other extended family, they live near like these large cities in China, Beijing, Shanghai. There, there are like huge levels of air pollution, right? Yes. And so I created a regression analysis uh, for them to use essentially. Uh, you know, just being able to see uh, air quality a few days in advance. That's such a simple thing, but that's also such an important thing. Just being able to plan ahead. Maybe I shouldn't go on Wednesday because AQI is like 130, I don't know, right? Yes. Yes. Especially if you're uh, like my relatives in China tend to be a little bit older 
And air pollution is like this horrible disease. Like it slowly like messes with your lungs and cardiovascular system. So mm -hmm. if you're vulnerable, you don't want to get exposed to that. I was in uh, Shanghai, actually, I should say it correctly, Shanghai, uh, but uh, a number of years ago, but I was very fortunate to come in right after a typhoon. So I saw yeah. Shanghai when it was amazing and clean and beautiful and clear and everything like that. But the air pollution can get really, really bad. For so you sure. built it to help your grandparents. Where did you go from there? Uh, yeah. So um, as it sort of goes with these things, like you start with a tech project, uh, you know, you go on Stack Overflow or you... Um, yes. Go on like some other resource like YouTube. And then after you just start getting into the field, right? And the great thing about the internet is that it's gotten, it gives you so much potential. It gives you so much opportunities. If you wanted to, you could probably get the equivalent of a computer science degree just by taking these online courses, edX, Coursera, right? You have the world's top universities, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, MIT, name them. They're putting up courses online for free. It's just great. <laughs> it's, it's like free money. Yeah, it's free real estate. And so you just take advantage of it and you just acquire as much information as you can. Um, there are great YouTube channels as well that just, they have like hour long tutorials on just how to build AI or like, uh, you know, teaching you how neural networks work and sort of the linear algebra behind that. Mm -hmm. And you just sort of take advantage of them and you read up on literature. And from there, you're able to identify a gap in the literature and hopefully fill it. Excellent. Excellent. So let's talk about your project and what you built. Um, you talked about open data sets and you're, you're doing it for a variety of cities or, or a number of cities now, I believe. What data are you using? Um, right now I'm uh, doing it for one city as a uh, sort of starting prototype. That's what I did for my conference paper. Um, the city that I chose was Los Angeles, California. And it was Los Angeles for a very specific reason. Um, California, ever since like the 2018s, they've been plagued by this problem of uh, wildfires, right? They've made the news and um, although they might not make the news right now, there are still wildfires going on right now in 2020. Just the Apple fire wow. called like people, they, residents had to evacuate. Um, so that's one of the um, areas in this country in which, well, I guess you live in Canada, but one of the areas in the United States <laughs> where you see um, air, sorry, yeah, um, where you see that you need these sort of error predicting prediction models. So that way you can hopefully uh, make sure that people can avoid um, the health risk to them and their family. Mm -hmm. So you picked LA um, and where are you getting your data sets from? Uh, they're all publicly online. And that's the amazing thing. You just have all these like uh, all these uh, publicly available data sets. So the ones that I use specifically, um, there's a data set by um, some Russian company called Reliable Prognosis 5. They host weather data. So I was just able to get uh, data from 2016 and mid 2018 uh, from there for Los Angeles, California. And for the pollutant information, you can find that on the Environmental Protection Agency's website. Uh, they host an air quality systems database. So you can just nice. download, uh, you know, any pollutant and just get that information. Nice. By city and by pollution level and all that stuff. So then you can start looking at the weather and you can start looking at its correlation with uh, air pollution on a variety of different levels. Um, what AI technologies did you implement uh, which, and which ones did you find were most effective? Yeah. So in my um, prototype, I used three main models. First is neural network, second is random forest, third is logistic regression, right? Each one has their advantages, each one has distinct disadvantages. Um, that's sort of the reason why I chose those three. And I was able to find that the combined model um, was able to have uh, more accuracy than any of the constituent models. Um, I found that the most effective were random forests, so random forests and any uh, modification thereof, as well as uh, neural networks uh, falling mm -hmm. close behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you you said you found a gap in the literature when you when you studied this before actually building your systems your frameworks and the gap in the literature that was most people were implementing ai to predict weather or to predict pollution were using a single methodology but yeah. you found that by implementing multiple you can get better prediction better predictability exactly that's i'm um, you know that's you kind of worded it better i mean you see like all this like oh there's like a bayesian model to predict you know like air quality uh, index using weather in hong kong right and it's all it's all very very like it, it only uses one method it only uses um you know one predictive factor but by leveraging um all of the major predictive factors as well as multiple machine learning methods you're able to get you know 92 percent prediction accuracy Cool. Uh, did you find any particular data that was more predictive of pollution index levels? Yeah. So my random forest uh, networks are, so with like 
neural networks is sort of a black box, but thankfully I also had random forest uh, models. And so they were sort of able to identify the uh, top predictors for pollution and uh, non-pollution um, sort of, um, so the first one is air quality index a day ago. Um, so that is no surprise. Really. <laughs> yes, I, that's understandable. Yeah, so that's, you know, if you're on day B and uh, you're trying to predict D, day B's AQI and you have day A, uh, air quality index, that's obviously going to be very helpful. Uh, it sort of stays constant. Then after the, uh, the next two, so number two and number three, um, were uh, PM 2.5 levels. So yes. particulate matter in the air, uh, 2.5 microns or less and a uh, sulfur dioxide concentration on day A. So that seems to be a uh, major factor. So that tells you that pollutants are extremely important. And the fourth uh, most major factor was uh, air pressure at sea level. So higher pressure correlates with higher amounts of pollution. Interesting, interesting. Did you do anything with COVID-19 and lockdowns? I mean, a lot of us globally noticed that when we had COVID-19 and lockdown, quarantine, whatever you want to call it, our air got cleaner. People in India saw the mountains, the Himalayas for the first time, right? Yeah. Uh, cities in, in China were, were, were clear. Beijing air was, was the sky was blue again. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and did you do any uh, work during that period of time? And, and, and what did you see if you did? Yeah, so I haven't actually uh, run my data set on like any like post COVID data, um, but because of like the way that my framework is structured and because it takes into uh, account not just weather, but also specific pollutant information, you'll see a decrease in things like 2 PM 2.5 and sulfur dioxide. And in turn, you'll see that the uh, results will be able to accurately reflect uh, the gotcha. AQI. Gotcha. I think it's really interesting though, that, um, you know, Eric, air quality is obviously improving, but it's only improving for as long as we can keep it, right? If we just return immediately back to our jobs once this pandemic is over, I'm not sure how big of an impact this will have in the long run. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so what's the future hold for you and your framework? Um, I, I believe you're building it out. You're trying to make it publicly available. Is that correct? Yeah, right now I'm uh, working on a web application and afterwards I'm planning to work on a mobile application. Cool. And so any ETA for that? Um, I would probably say in like uh, three months or two months uh, or one month. I'm not sure. Uh, but, <laughs> I guess it um, depends on how much homework you have to do. You're still in grade 11. So there is, you know, teachers are annoying. They, they ask you to actually get some th stuff done occasionally. Uh, if any teachers are watching this, I do not endorse this message. I absolutely love your class. <laughs> I love wow. class. So, um, you know. What data would you love to have that you don't have right now that you think would, would be really, really interesting in helping AI predict pollution levels? Um, probably the very interesting, uh, a concept that I was actually thinking about was you're starting to see the rise of a uh, keyword analytics, right? So like the whole idea of like, if you have, uh, let's say, especially in Los Angeles, California, if you see all of a sudden that there's a ton of news articles writing um, about wildfires. Maybe you should take that into account in pollution, right? Maybe that tells you that, oh, some stuff is about to go down, right? Um, so that's definitely something that I'm, uh, I want to incorporate into my model. Interesting. Very good. Maybe uh, something even searching Twitter or something like that or uh, recent photos uh, would be interesting as well. Well, very interesting stuff. Uh, very impressive, uh, especially at your age, what you're doing. Um, and I uh, look forward to impressive things in the future. Are you looking, are you thinking of maybe doing a startup at some point in the future? Or is, is that something you're looking at? Or, or have you not looked that far out? I know you're applying to colleges and universities right now. Uh, yeah, I never actually thought of uh, doing a startup, but um, it seems like this idea is good enough that I would actually, I would actually love to like you know work with a bunch of friends and try to make this like a reality. Um, get some like automatically updating web and mobile API, right? Uh, make the data publicly available, and hopefully like when you open the weather app, right, you'll be able to see um you know not just tomorrow's temperature, but also tomorrow's um pollution, right? Yeah, and something like yes. that. Yes, interesting. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. For everybody else, thank you as well. Uh, thank you for joining us on Tech First. My name is John Kutsir. I appreciate you being along for the ride. Hey, whatever platform you're on, please like, subscribe, share, comment, all the above. If you're on the podcast, you like it, hey, rate it, review it. That'd be a massive help. Until next time, this is John Kutsir with Tech First.